Hey, good morning slash good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Scott Latchett. I am a partner and president of research and strategy at PSFK, and I am excited to be joined by Adriana, who is ultimately the author of this report. Um, she is an old colleague of mine who we've roped back in to help present the research today. Um, and we're excited to share with you um, a look at the DTC landscape and the things that have changed and updated in light of um, everything that is happening with, oh, I'm, my computer seems to have frozen. Let me see if I can change things up for a second, sorry. Looking good, Scott. Okay. Um, so we're excited to share some of the findings from this particular piece of research. And let's just get into it because we have a lot to cover in the next 25 or so minutes. As we all sort of exist in this kind of limbo as we're, as we're thinking about all the impacts that have happened as a result of COVID-19, um, what we're really seeing is a remaking of the retail marketplace and a lot of the assumptions and the way businesses operated before have completely changed. And before we get into the meat of this report, um, I just want to step in and provide a little bit of context to some of the major changes that are happening. Um, first and foremost, there's no going back to the retail status quo. Um, the way things were have completely been upended and disrupted as a result of this. As Piers mentioned at the outset, a lot of the traditional channels that brands would have previously sold through might not even exist um, you know, tomorrow or months from now. And so what happens when um, you know, wholesale or retail channels disappear? Second is from a consumer point of view or shopper point of view, uh, as a result of everything that's happening right now, there's been completely new behavioral patterns that are being forged as a result of um, everything that's happening. You, know, you have more consumers that are shopping online. Um, a lot of that is out of necessity, but once they recognize the, the benefits of doing so, and that's really sort of pushing that um, expectation forward um, and brands need to be able to, um, to react to that. And then this statistic up at the corner, um, the fact that online shopping share of sales has jumped 10% in a matter of months is pretty incredible just to see that happening. And we su suspect a lot of that sustained growth is gonna, is gonna stay. As a result of this, we're really in the midst of an, of an acceleration point, both in terms of consumer behavior, but more so in terms of what that means for brands and their retail partners. Um, I think a lot of people can look at this um, as a crisis, but really this is an opportunity to rethink the things that, that didn't work um, and fix those or, or reinvent new ways of of um, selling and marketing and, and having relationships with consumers, as well as to refine some of the things that, that sort of have come as a result of this. Um, and I, I love the statistic at the bottom. Um, you know, I, I wonder who the 1% is in this context, but you know, 99% of consumer goods leaders are already, um, you know, before COVID was happening, thinking about direct to consumer. Um, and you know, this is hopefully now that that last 1% has been convinced that this is something that's important to consider. Um, and then finally, you know, this is time for um, leaders to ultimately emerge. You know, this is gonna set a new stage for what retail's future will look like. And um, you know, I think the brands that are ready to seize on that opportunity are the ones that are ultimately going to succeed. But then certainly, um, you know, fast followers are are also um, you know in a in a great position as well. So what we've developed as a result of this report is um, this framework for brands to take action. And um, I will allow Adriana <laughs> to um, jump in here in just a sec, but I'll talk about the, the sort of columns here and how we've set this up. Um, we're really looking at this around these three sort of key stages, if you will, in terms of what we're calling owning the experience, which is ultimately positioned uh, primarily for brand experience teams, but this is thinking about 
how brands can step in and really um, own that shopper experience and sort of provide value to consumers within um, that sort of shopping journey, which tradi traditionally has been something that's been owned by, by retail partners. Um, secondly, is thinking about re-energizing that relationship with consumers and how you're really sort of building community, building that one-to-one -one relationship with individual consumers and how you're continuing to sort of add value throughout that relationship, which again, for us is really important to think about that as a, as a cycle. So it doesn't end at the transaction, but really is that ability to continue to sort of engage um, and elevate those, those consumers and shoppers um, to ultimately become brand ambassadors on behalf of, of your brand. Um, and then finally, thinking about this from the standpoint of the infrastructure, um, which is really sort of targeting those operational and logistics teams. Um, this is really thinking about what happens in the sort of mechanics of selling. Um, how are you um, providing everything from checkout and financing all the way through to um, the, the, the sort of getting the product in the hands of consumers? Um, and I will uh, step back for a moment and let Adriana discuss how we've sort of broken this out in terms of uh, a timeline in, uh, for action here. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Um, this might be a little bit self-explanatory, what the rows mean, but ultimately we want to provide you, our brands, as well as the retail partners who are listening, key steps that allow you to visualize where you should be investing your time and when. We know that there are some immediate decisions that you either are making right now or will be need to making in the next probably month or so. This is what we cover in the do today section of each of these different columns and categories that Scott's mentioned. We also want to think about how we prepare and plan for the near term. And this near term might look about three months out through the rest of 2020 as we enter into 2021. However, we also want to acknowledge for each of these components, the customer experience, the brand relationship, and ultimately your operational infrastructure, there will be a new normal. And that's something that you and your team should be planning forward. So just as you read this whole chart, two big takeaways to, to understand is that each of your teams, your engagement teams, your infrastructure teams should have short-term and long-term goals for how they will be responding to this moment as they redevelop their, their different team cadence. And lastly, we wanna make sure that your current responses are multidisciplinary and your long-term responses are multidisciplinary. So just, just to note, we always wanna make sure that we're bringing all voices of your brand to the table as we think about immediate responses, and long-term solutions. Amazing, thanks for that, Adriana. And we'll be sort of going through and, and both discussing um, this framework in more detail as we go through. We set this presentation up a little bit differently than, than we typically do, because there's so much great sort of analysis within the context of this framework. So we won't be getting it really into the nitty gritty of the trends, so to speak, but we wanted to kind of walk you through each of these um, three stages and, and talk about what this means from the standpoint of the timeline that Adriana has developed within the context of this report. So as we think about that um, shopper experience and the do today sort of component, within the customer mindset, they're, you know, they're very anxious to sort of return to a regular lifestyle, there's a lot of uncertainty that's sort of existing within the marketplace and just sort of day-to-day -day life in general. But um, you know, the way that physical retail is, exists currently is it's just, it's not really there yet. Um, and so even as stores reopen, um, there's limited services available, they're not able to sort of offer that, that full slate of you know, sort of very personalized experience within the context of that. And so this is really an opportunity for brands to kind of step in um, today and really help streamline that purchase path um, and reduce some of the frustrations associated with those in-store visits um, and ultimately think about um, how they make that shopper experience feel more manageable. Um, there's a lot that's happening in terms of front-loading the 
um, shopper experience in terms of the research and planning that people are doing online today. So there's really an opportunity here to help people make smarter decisions, whether they're going to be um, making a purchase directly through a digital sales channel or ultimately moving into the store so that they don't necessarily have to be doing so much browsing as they get into that experience. Um, and then ultimately thinking about, um, you know, how you provide a, as much information as possible leading into potentially that, that store visit. So as Scott mentioned, um, maybe the first step is thinking about how your brand responds to browsing. And for the near term, there's a different understanding that your brand can respond to the expertise that customers need. So we have to acknowledge the new reality. A customer can do all their research and make their decision without ever really setting foot into a retail store. Let's not romanticize it, it's kind of the reality. And as brands, we know that your brand teams have in-house experts. These are, depending on your industry, designers, they can be chefs, they can be scientists. Um, these experts have the, the intelligence and the know-how that really is what customers are looking for. And so in the near term, Consider how your brand can take the experts that you have in-house and provide them directly to consumers. So here are some opportunities to think about virtual consultations or on-demand coaching and assistance. In the near term, we see that this will maybe reestablish what we ultimately need to consider as part of our purchase plan. Yeah, it's really amazing. I, I love, I, I think within the context of this is this kind of notion of trust as well. Um, here and then, you know, as Adriana's laid this out, I think, you know, this very much exists within that sort of shopping experience, but then also looking at all the ways that that sort of can exist after a sale is made. So um, unboxing experiences and sort of onboarding, as well as helping consumers sort of um, do more within the context of that, that product as well. And then as we think about establishing a new normal, um, you know, again, these sort of longer term plans are really sort of thinking about how you capitalize on the opportunity that exists today um, and really, um, you know, sort of understand how you can build loyalty here in terms of that um, shopper relationship that you have. Um, one of the things that we think is really interesting here is how you start to sort of build new business models within the context of um, that sort of shopping experience. Um, ultimately thinking about things like subscription-based services, which again can be um, additive value. You can think about how they grow alongside a um, consumer or a shopper, um, as well as sort of, again, thinking about uh, building these bundling sort of experiences so that um, you're locking consumers in more long term, but not in a sort of negative way, but but adding more value through um, the way that you're sort of curating these um, experiences. And then uh, again, as a part of that is thinking about how you sort of own that loyalty experience as well. Um, thinking about what loyalty means, um, how you value your consumer, not only in terms of that sort of transactional value that they bring, but as they um, you know, share um, through social media, as they provide reviews, um, all of those things are hugely important for um, brands to consider and consumers should be rewarded for those and there's a lot of opportunity to sort of grow that relationship there. So the next area that we're gonna look at is ultimately the customer relationship. And so something that even until probably the last few years, you internally at your brand, at your brand teams might have talked about is what anchors the relationship. And usually that anchor was a store visit, right? So we would kind of bring in our social media or we would bring in our marketing to encourage someone to visit the store, the dealership, the pharmacy, et cetera. Well, as COVID has shown us, store visits don't necessarily need to be the anchor of our customer relationships anymore. And these anchor moments can be apps, they can be websites, they can be digital spaces. And so we need to think about making those rather than transitive experiences, making them anchor experiences. A lot of this works around using those to build authentic community. And so we see the opportunity to live stream, 
that community, as well as to amplify the, the incredible experts and influencers that you have online um, in order to make anchor points where customers really build trust and don't just feel shoved into the next store or into the next promotion. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty incredible in terms of looking at what's been happening within the context of COVID and the brands that already had established communities were much more positioned um, to really sort of pivot and think about how they could step in and provide support, um, provide additional value. You know, as simple as, um, you know, when we all sort of transition to digital only, um, you know, finding moments and ways to kind of bring communities together to sort of eliminate some of that loneliness and stress and things like that that were happening, which I think is pretty incredible. Um, and so further to that point, you know, as we think about planning for the near term, again, this is sort of thinking about that product experience and extending that um, similar to um, that sort of expertise that Adriana spoke about um, previously is how you kind of leverage those one-to-one um, -one relationships and those digital channels that you have to really kind of help consumers not only optimize the product experience that they have, but also think about the adjacencies that kind of exist around that. And, and for me, what that ultimately means is you know, you are, your brand is a part of a bigger lifestyle, a bigger sort of solution set that um, consumers are ultimately trying to achieve. So how can you provide that level of expertise sort of beyond the product to help them grow within the context of their personal life or their lifestyle? And, you know, that is ultimately going to, you know, provide a lot of value to consumers and, and really make them feel that, um, you know, the brand is there for the long term as well. Just to even add on that point, we see so many individuals really investing in themselves at this time, choosing a new hobby, learning a new skill, or really focusing on their wellness. And so thinking about how your product purchase can adjacently help someone learn to cook or learn to garden, um, making that transition between product and lifestyle is even more important right now. And then when it comes to the long-term relationship or establishing a new normal, we know that this purchase by purchase, store visit by store visit cadence is no longer necessarily going to be the status quo. And so you have this white space to reimagine what cadence needs to mean with your customers. And ultimately we see this as an opportunity to think about cadence in terms of personalized insights and relationship. Rather than going purchase by purchase, can you go data share by data share? Uh, can you ultimately think about learning by learning? And so we see opportunities for you to calibrate your product, whether that's you know having a digital measurement system before you even make a purchase as part of that path, or even predictive selling, reaching out to a customer before they necessarily have said that they're ready to maybe upgrade and giving them really helpful contextual nudges that encourage them to grow in their skill or grow in themselves. Um, so ultimately we don't see that products um, or excuse me, purchases need to be the only way to move a relationship forward any longer. Yeah, and it's really interesting here. I mean, obviously all of what we're talking about is getting closer and closer to um, maintaining that, that relationship and that sort of connection with the consumer. And here it's really sort of, um, you know, getting even, thinking about getting even closer to personalize that experience and make it feel like it's designed specifically for, for you as an individual. And then as we move into the final um, section here, which is again, thinking about redesigning your retail infrastructure, really this is focused on the operational side of things. Um, you know, there's, Disruption is is sort of one of the huge things that has resulted from COVID-19. Um, you know, if we think about sort of essential services early on, grocery shopping, et cetera, there was a big pinch point in terms of supply chains getting essential products um, to the places where people needed them. Um, and that caused a lot of uncertainty um, amongst consumers and, you know, frankly, added to a lot of the you know, sort of crazy behaviors that people were adopting kind of early on. So 
um, you know, how can you as a brand sort of rethink your operations so that you can be much more flexible and agile in terms of those part, those broader partnerships that you have and the sort of, um, you know, all those links in the chain um, to really, um, you know, kind of overcome those future disruptions that, you know, likely will happen at some, at some point um, and ensure that um, consumers feel comfortable and confident that um, the things that they want are ultimately going to be available to them. And so um, just to kind of give you a taste of the, the way the report is constructed, we want to just sort of dive into the two trends that we have within this section as well. So maybe Adriana, you could talk about this here. Sure. So as Scott mentioned, when you have access to the full report, you'll see examples and trends that build up each of these learnings we're providing. So that's really helpful as you think about how you present this to your team members or possibly to your leaders or to your board. And so here, as we talk about operations, we've noticed that several brands have invested heavily at this moment in terms of direct selling, actually creating DTC channels internally to meet gaps in the retail market. So for example, PepsiCo has created uh, ultimately a DTC, two DTC e-commerce websites where people can order bundles of their favorite beverages and also snacks. So if you check out snacks.com or pantryshop.com, these are both Pepsi owned websites and they're the first foray that this brand has taken into selling directly, not necessarily through merchandisers. And we've seen customers who were worried about getting some of their favorite snacks, ultimately going to this platform to circumvent the retail uh, headaches or maybe stop gaps that they were seeing. Yeah, it's incredible within the context of CPG, obviously there's always been a challenge to, to think about the cost associated with you know, the logistics of actually getting these kind of lower priced items to consumers. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how um, you know, this, this platform continues to sort of evolve in that context. And then secondly, um, with respect to CPG, you know, a lot of what was happening in the midst of you know, the sort of height of the crisis was that people were switching brands because you know their favorites weren't available, and so something like this overcomes those challenges directly for consumers as well. And then Great. along, oh, sorry, go go for it, Adriana. No, just the last quick note. Another example is that we noticed that customers and service retail, or excuse me, brands and service retailers, ultimately that weren't able to provide services pivoted to offered bundled products and bundled value. So for example, uh, a London-based brew, brewing company offered a pub in the box, which contained core beers, glasses, some snacks, and a mat. So ultimately we see the opportunity for experiences and value to be bundled. And then customers can opt into that and have that experience in their homes. While this has absolutely been part of the social distancing and stay in place, orders, we do see that, you know, modulating uh, different experiences and value is a new retail trend that's here to stay. Yeah, and this one was really cool because I think, it again, this, this touches on that sort of lifestyle piece that we spoke about before here, which is really sort of thinking about where a product kind of fits into this broader ecosystem, if you will, and how you can bring in partners um, whether that's, you know, again, other brands or media platforms and things like that as well to really kind of like create this broader experience that situates your, your product in a new way. And so what does this mean in the near term? This is something that I think um, an opportunity that brands really have to not just do well, but to do good in the community. Um, and that's noticing that both the retail partners that you often work with, as well as customers, are, um, are ultimately at points of financial constraint. And so how can brands be more flexible with their sales terms and their purchase terms, uh, ultimately to provide support? And so we see extended support in terms of reducing, reducing fees, as well as digital layaway being an increasing opportunity to make sure customers can make the purchases that they need. Yeah, and again, this is just recognizing the realities that consumers are going through and having those the ability to kind of like put these processes in place to recognize some of that and 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 really sort of step in and, and help consumers through some of these tough moments. 
And then finally, as we look at the last sort of um, component of this, establishing a new normal within that um, retail infrastructure piece, we're really sort of thinking about twofold here. Um, one, the role that consumers play within the sort of operational strategy that, that brands have, both in terms of um, the way that they're selling, but in terms of the way they're sort of thinking about creating products and, and sort of refining products throughout that process. And so here we're looking at the, that feedback loop that can be generated once you have some of these mechanisms in place to really sort of help um, listen to consumers um, and design products that sort of meet their needs or refine them um, in time. And then alongside of that is having the, the responsive operations in place that are able to, to look at these trends or this feedback that's coming in in real time and responding to that in, in kind. Um, and again, I think what's, what's really sort of interesting here is the sort of feedback loop that is generated and what that means sort of more broadly from an operational point of view as well. I know we're, I know we're getting close to being um, out of time, so um, I, I don't want to um, you know, sort of skip over this, but we can kind of go through quickly um, as, as we sort of close out the presentation. We really sort of looked at, at this um, in terms of these broader learnings from the standpoint of kind of three approaches here, um, which is, um, you know, whether you have um, small teams in place that are um, sort of building out a DTC pipeline from scratch within the context of your organization, um, if you're in a position from a bigger sort of brand point of view to um, acquire and, and sort of operationalize and scale a um, direct to consumer brand within your organization, um, or if you're sort of investing in new and emerging brands within the context of that as well. Yeah, so first, if you do manage an internal DTC, make sure that your team is ready to lead the rest of the company. It is another, let's say, operational hiccup like COVID. We can think about a second, second wave of lockdowns, for example. Those DTC teams will be called upon to act. So foster very close relationships with those leaders. Also, assess your own threshold for rapid prototyping. Are you comfortable with a minimum viable product? Um, how refined do your websites and your plans need to be? And assess that so that you can act quickly. Uh, and lastly, think about that you're for sure investing in rapid prototyping. How are you confirming that you have the operational capacity to get things off the ground within a few weeks or within a month? And if you're acquiring or have acquired a DTC company, um, you know, making sure that that sort of new leadership that comes in isn't sort of siloed away within the context of the organization, but has um, those leaders also helping um, other teams within the organization really sort of rethink the way that they're doing things. Um, ensuring that there's that sort of core integration um, within with the new brand as well as within the existing organization so that um, everyone is sort of bringing that knowledge to bear within the context of everything from messaging to, to sort of that logistics piece. Um, and then thinking about how, again, those sort of adjacencies and we're seeing some really interesting sort of synergies happening within the marketplace space where, um, you know, sort of brands are opening the doors for one another. So how do you take your existing brands and, and new brands and sort of create inroads for one another within that context? And last but not least, if you are a DTC brand or if you're incubating them, make sure you have a growth strategy. So when the opportunity or the moment arises like COVID did in March, you're ready to know which projects to green light with. We, you know, being late to the game once happens, being late to the game twice, uh, we ultimately know should not be the case. Ultimately, use your retailers and your merchandisers as testing partners. Think about where you're testing opportunities in real time and ultimately hold your own projects to larger standards. Make sure you're using the KPIs that the rest of a brand company might use or that other large scale brands are using. This will ultimately make sure that you're measuring success the same way as the incumbents. Well, thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Scott, so much for uh, uh, the presentation. That research is a great way to kind of frame the day 
and um, help us think through um, kind of the strategies and opportunities. So thank you, appreciate it. And thanks for coming by today.